Hey everyone, hey uh, Rage Against the Clampdown. So I'm responding to Rage Against the Clampdown's response to my response to Green Ghost on whether the market is coercive and I was uh, supporting the yes position, Green Ghost was supporting the no position. Um, and so I'm going to kind of try to keep it brief also uh, and you know it's not your fault but I when you made your video you had my video playing in the background and you were answering you know talking about what I was saying and it's one of my foibles I hate the sound of my own voice <laughs> so I kinda I kinda zone out immediately when I do <laughs> which makes me really bad at editing my videos which is why I usually don't and you can ask why do I make YouTube videos I guess you know I do have a big mouth um, just I always I'm always painfully aware how much nonsense it spouts when I have to listen to myself but that's why I hope that I got the gist and all of the important parts out of the video and I'll try to address them. Um, so, I mean, first thing I wanted to address is my unfair comparison of the gun to the head. Um, and I, I agree it's not actually a good, you know, I mean, it's not really a good analogy for um, for how we had the economy today. Um, but it wasn't meant to be. What it was meant to just illustrate is the fact that you can be in a situation where you make a free choice, and as a matter of fact, you always make a free choice, but that does not mean that the situation can't be coercive. Um, so just because when you have the gun to your head, you can still say no and you get shot in the head, does not mean the situation is not coercive. Similarly, just because um, you can walk away from a job um, and then try another job and if all of the jobs are not treating you fairly you can walk away from all of them and live in the forest just because that's your free choice does not mean it's not coercive that doesn't mean that those two situations are equal in magnitude as a matter of fact obviously the second is far less serious than getting shot in the head nevertheless my point um, stands that you can have a situation in which you make a free choice but the situation is still coercive and I think my second analogy was um, was a, a an acceptable analogy for the situation today. Well, not necessarily an acceptable analogy for a situation as it exists today, but in terms of kind of the magnitude of what can happen if you just accept um, that people, as long as they make a free choice, aren't being coerced. And that was my example of the desert. If you see someone that's dying of thirst in the desert and they're lost, um, and they're a billionaire, um, well, if you give them water and show them the way out, which takes you five minutes, nothing out of your life, then then they're fine, but you ask them all their money for it. Now, is that coercive or not? I mean, if you didn't come along, they would die anyways. So you can say, well, if I just leave, they're in the same situation they were before they met me, so it's not really coercive. Um, and it's their own free choice whether they take me up on the offer or not. I would argue that's a coercive situation. You're coercing them because you have power over their life and death. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think you have a ethical obligation and I think it should be a legal obligation to help them. Um, and I think that should go, so that's an extreme example. But I think you can find many similar examples in everyday life where people are in fact coerced. Um, it might not be a life or death scenario, although, you know, if you look at people and the various kind of health care expenses and things, it, there were situations certainly where it has been, um, where people are coerced um, by people that for whatever reason um, have power over them. And it may be that that power they came by um, through means which we consider legitimate, like the bottle of water I have and the reason I know the way out of the desert. Um, you know, I got that bottle of water myself and I know the way out of the desert because I go there every day. Um, I just happen to drive through the desert, you know. But just because I got those fair and square doesn't mean it's fair and square to just force the other guy to give me everything just from five minutes out of my time. Um, as for all work being coercive and I guess uh, the overarching argument of um, of what I think about work um, well I mean first of all work isn't coercive but what makes you work might be coercive and I will argue yes 
almost all work aside from very few I mean if you're a billionaire then no one can really coerce you to work anymore because you're fine if you work or not if you're not a billionaire and there are a variety of pressures on you these pressures are coercing you these may be pressures of paying your mortgage or your your rent or your food or your health care bill or they may even be subtler pressures of um, just maintaining a respectable enough lifestyle that doesn't make you deeply unhappy um, on a psychological level um, these are all coercive effects as far as I'm concerned I know that certain people want to exclude those from the analysis and say the only way you can coerce someone is if you put you know the political gun to their heads um, I don't see it that way I see I see it that way that you can very well coerce people um, in situations where they have less power and you have more power and that power may well be economic power so in my worldview there are you know I mean you can always split it up into as many categories as you like but when I analyze the current system three kinds of power there's um, military power which I guess is kind of the rough and tumble of it that's what you end up with in the Congo say then you have political power um, which is um, which is well political power and then you have kind of associated things like um, all of those other powers to influence people's views of the world um, and then you have uh, the power of property but the power of property is linked not just to political power which I mean we can get rid of political power with anarchy let's say it's also linked to the power of ideas um, and by itself uh, it's enormously strong in that through the economies of scale uh, you have a tremendous ability to make more money with that money once you have that money and there's nothing in a free market that would prevent that from happening <laughs> actually it would be magnified probably uh, this effect I mean yes you would not have politicians covering your butt but you wouldn't need them I mean if you come to a bank with you know you're borrowing mo amounts of money which are so and so much greater than most of your competitors you can set the uh, the terms to that bank you can say you're not gonna loan to those people and unless unless they're gonna make anywhere near that money um, loaning to that person or that person they're not gonna do it and I mean you know there's lots of everyday examples of that and they usually verge on illegality but they would happen like um, in Australia you often will only find uh, one supermarket in a shopping center and that means it's quite expensive because their lease part of it is if you put in any other supermarket you know then we're not gonna lease with you anymore so uh, there's lots of and again that's 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 a form of coercion by the owners the the CEO of the supermarket on the on the proprietor of the shopping center which is a much smaller player and then they coerce their suppliers into giving them goods at a very unreasonable rate that makes the farmers unhappy and the state has no place in that at all it does it's not the state that's supporting these coercive relationships it's that one player with so much more money more capital really has that coercive power in a market um, and I I I just haven't heard of an analysis that convinced me uh, can convince me otherwise um, as for a system I guess where you would have uh, capital kind of I guess um, freely available to everyone at a similar price I, I think that's what you were suggesting which um, is obviously uh, some of the mutualist kind of ideas have like banks where everyone can borrow money at a no interest or whatever um, well you know it's and that would probably be a good step towards things and it would get rid of a lot of coercion of course that would in itself be a huge hobbling of the free market because really the free market is um, no regulations and that in itself is a regulation a quite big one and I th I think that's what you were kind of alluding to so that's no longer a free market at all that's a very tightly uh, more tightly regulated I would say than today's market um, and yeah I, I, I think that 
I mean, in my analysis of history, uh, the reason why we came to capitalism, and like Marx, um, and I'm not a Marxist, but like Marx, I see capitalism as a big step up from feudalism. Um, but the reason we came to that is because before we had just this power in the handful of a couple of rich people, and we wanted to distribute that power more widely. The middle class, which was small but sizable enough, wanted power to not be collected into the hand of one person that could then just smash them. So they said, we'll create this property and we'll all have a bit of a share of it. And there we go. Um, power problem solved. The only problem is that as soon as that stuff starts collecting again, that money, that's just the power that we dissipated away from the ruler. When it starts collecting again into big, big spheres of money, um, into big corporations, um, and that's what will happen in the free market. I, I'm, I'm sure of it, um, because there won't be any opposing force left. So right now, actually, we're kind of tr separating it. Um, you know, we're separating it out by saying, okay, we have money power, we have capital power, and we have political power. So we kind of double. You know, we got, we do the double thing. Um, if we got rid of one of those, then the other one would be the sole means of power, and in my view, that would make uh, the power that that, um, that branch wields all the greater. My feeling is we should not support any power accumulation, and any form of free market will produce, in my view, power accumulation, unless you regular, you know, I mean, you could say, we'll just redistribute all the money like monopoly money every 10 years, then obviously can't accumulate. But show me the mo show me the market that stayed stable, where people haven't started making more and more money um, as time goes by. And then you can obviously say that that's because of uh, state capitalism, but I don't buy that. Um, b because certainly people buy politicians. But politics also does get into the in the way of that process. So is it in the on the net a benefit or a detriment to those big players? I can't honestly say one way or the other. But certainly, even if it's a benefit, it's not the major benefit. Um, so in my view of the world, we would be going a dangerous path if we trusted in the market not being coercive, because. Um, whilst a, a market initially, if we distribute all the money equally, will be very uncoercive in the beginning, um, just like the market was um, uh, at various points after a big scale redistribution, it will wind up becoming more and more coercive as the power gets centralized. Um, and it will, you know, I mean, you're, you're, I always, you know, it's, oh no, those communists, they had the centralized power and it was all in the hands of the Politburo. We have the Politburo today, and there's these filthy rich CEOs and billionaires, and the politicians. So they still have to talk to each other, but it's getting there. It's a it's a ruling elite. Now, whether we have a ruling elite of rich business people or those people, it's the same kind of deal. And wealth inequalities um, are going skyrocketing. Um, and the reason how we've kind of managed to get beyond that in the past is we had a huge crisis that just destroyed enormous amounts of wealth and reset everything. So World War II was pretty good because once you blow up half the world and destroy all, you know, all that wealth, then you're going to have a lot of people starting off at a fairly equal level. Um, then you're going to have a lot of grow uh, room for growth where, you know, no one's really treading on each other's feet yet. But eventually, you'll get back to where we are now, in my opinion, which is a state where it's becoming increasingly coercive. And if you look at work conditions, um, I think you can see that perfectly. I mean, workers' rights were things that we fought very hard for. And the idea behind those was to stop workers, employees, uh, from being coerced by their employers from doing things that were not reasonable, like working completely unreasonable hours uh, working under unsafe conditions, and so on and so forth. And we're losing these rights. We're having them gnawed away. Um, and so we're enabling, again, coer increased coercion of the working class. Coercion which, at this stage, I, I believe, is certainly becoming unreasonable. 
um, where you could say that there is a s reasonable standard or amount of coercion that you want to apply to people to make them work, I think it is becoming very unreasonable. Um, and that's my opinion on the matter. I'm sure I haven't really answered it. And it's 15 minutes long and it was a big ramble. <laughs> I apologize. Anyways, um, thanks for your response video. I enjoyed it, even though I hate the sound of my own voice. So um, if you want to, you know, if you want to do me a favor, if you respond to me, then uh, <laughs> please don't have me playing in the background. I just can't stand listening to myself. All right. See you guys later. Uh, see you. Um, rage against the clamp down. There we go. All right.